to this Friday of another Solanaci seminar online. Um, today we have Lynn Boss with us that we are, he, she's going to talk of, um, about the spicy Solanaci. So Lynn Boss received her bachelor degree at the University of New Hampshire and has master's and PhD at Harvard University with which, uh, Dr. Richard Schultes. Um, for her PhD, she studied uh, the biology and taxonomy of the genus Hippomandra in the Solanaceae, which is now known as Solanum section uh, Pachyphila. She has spent her entire career working on Solanaceae systematics, and her field work is primarily concentrated in the neotropics. She has been at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City since 1989, where she teaches uh, several botanical field courses. In addition to Solanaceae systematics, she enjoys a lot hiking, birding, skying, boating, camping, and fishing. And today, as I said before, she's going to talk about an update on recent and current projects on spicy Solanaceae. So thank you, Lynn, and you can now share your screen. Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's so nice to see you all on these Solanaceae seminars. And I want to give a, a big thanks and shout out to Rocio and Andres and Chelsea for organizing them. Uh, these have really keep, helped me keep positive during COVID times. And I'm sure that if we just stick it out, we'll be able someday to travel and see each other and collect our Solanaceae. So I haven't been able to attend most of the talks live this semester because I have a class right after this time slot. Um, but today um, I'm not having class because one of my students came down with COVID. So my class is all quarantining until next week. So I can hang out with you guys uh, today after the seminar and we can chit chat or talk and, or answer questions. Um, so let's talk about Solanaceae. And uh, I'll just remind you that it's a medium-sized family with about 90 genera and somewhere around 3,000 to 4,000 species. So many of you know that I've spent almost my entire career, or most of my career, working on Solanum, which, as you can see here, is by far the largest genus in the Solanaceae. And we've had several large collaborative projects, and as a result of them, we've really made incredible progress in understanding this humongous genus. Uh, so it's just some of the highlights of the progress that we've made. Uh, first of all, we have a great um, idea of what the phylogeny of, of Solanum looks like now. When I started working on this family, we had literally basically no phylogenetic knowledge. So just as, a, as an example, Here's the uh, over a thousand tip tree of Sarkinen et al. that was published in 2013. Uh, this is a major accomplishment and a, a lot of our uh, selenium data actually has gone into making this tree. So uh, the, these phylogenetic trees have been this, the starting off point for looking at many of the individual clades within the Solanaceae and then also uh, looking at, at many evolutionary questions, and we've heard a lot of, um, uh, about that in some of the seminars uh, this semester. Uh, so another major accomplishment that I'll remind you about is, um, oh, I'm having trouble here, oh, here we go, is our Solanaceae Source website. Um, so this is a one-stop shop, tons of information about uh, Solanum and about Solanaceae in general. So on the Solanaceae source, you can find species descriptions, specimen data, images, uh, nomenclature, typification, and the most recent addition to the Solanaceae source are these um, multi-access identification keys to, to the major clades of Solanum. And we heard um, about these a couple weeks ago from Re Rebecca Hilgenhoff. Well, I'm still working on <laughs> Solanum many projects with a lot of you. Uh, but today, I'd like to give you an update on some other projects that I've been involved with recently. Uh, and these concern the genera Lysianthes and Capsicum, Witheringia and Brachistus, and I'll say a few things about Quatrusia. Uh, so in addition to Selenum, we've got a current project to examine the uh, 
phylogeny and taxonomy of the gen genera Capsicum and Lysianthes. And together, these genera include about 250 species. So as you may know, the genus Capsicum includes the chili peppers and their relatives. Uh, so these are plants that are familiar to most people, are incredibly important economically. So chili peppers were over a billion dollar industry each year in the United States alone in the last several years. But we still have a lot to learn about their taxonomy and phylogeny. So to um, attack capsicum, we got a grant and assembled a team. Uh, so here's the members of our team, Chili Pepper. So it's me at the University of Utah, uh, Gloria Barbosa from the University of Cordoba in Argentina. And uh, Gloria is the world's expert on capsicum taxonomy. Uh, we also have Ellen Dean uh, from UC Davis. Looks like she's got some nice looking Solanaceae in her bowl there. Uh, and Ellen is a taxonomic expert on the genus Lysianthes. And then, of course, we have our, uh, our great friend and colleague, Sandy Knapp. So Sandy and I have our longtime collaborators. We've worked together for a long, long time on a lot of, of projects. Uh, Sandy's at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, so she knows everything about Solanaceae, everything about nomenclature. Um, and our website, uh, the Solanaceae source, is hosted at the Natural History Museum. So she keeps our website and our database up to date. And then the other member of our project is Daniel Spalick. Uh, he was a postdoc with me at the University of Utah until recently. Uh, he's now an assistant professor at Texas A&M University. And Daniel did all the bioinformatic um, analyses that I'll talk about today. He also is a, a, amazing at making graphics. So he designed beautiful slides and um, graphics for our presentations and our publications. Well, the first thing we, went, we needed to do if we were going to tackle capsicum is we need to know what its close relatives are. So uh, here's the tree of uh, Tina Sarkinen et al. Again. And if I blow up the part of this tree that includes capsicum, we see that its sister group is uh, Lysianthes. Um, and morphologically then, capsicum and Lysianthes uh, share something in common. So they have an unusual calyx structure with five to 10 teeth emerging below the rim. So in uh, most species of Solanaceae, aside from these two genera, if there are teeth on the calyx, they come out right from the edge of the calyx, not below it. And I think you can see this structure best in this drawing in the middle. So the teeth are coming out not right at the edge, but below the edge. Well, capsicum includes about 35 to 40 species. This is a new world genus, but uh, capsicum peppers are cultivated worldwide as crops. Uh, and the distinctive features that uh, distinguish capsicum from Lysianthes are its anthers. So in capsicum, the anthers open by longitudinal slits here. And this is the normal mode of anther dehiscence in most of the Solanaceae and in most angiosperms in general. Uh, capsicum flowers also produce nectar. So there's a nectary down at the base of the flower. And then in many species, the nectar oozes out onto the surface of the corolla. So these kind of shiny greenish blobs are dabs of nectar. Um, capsicum, Diversity is really uh, remarkable in wild species, much more so than in the uh, cultivated species. So we have lots of variety in flower form and color uh, that the corallos can be white or yellow, purple, they can have uh, spots towards the inside. And most of the fruits in capsicum are round and red uh, and usually and often held upright. But uh, there are some exceptions like this Capsicum shadianum has yellow fruits. And later on, I'm gonna tell you about a fantastic um, species of capsicum that has dark purple fruits. Well, capsicum peppers are major ingredients in cuisines throughout the world. They're used raw or cooked. 
They're added to many different dishes and used to make hot sauce and salsas. So here's a picture I, I took at an incredible shop in Brazil that was called Pepper Paradise. And in there were just every kind of pepper that you could possibly imagine and every kind of pepper product. Uh, capsicum peppers are major ingredients in several regional cuisines. So Hungarian goulash has paprika from capsicum annuum as a major ingredient in its uh, flavoring. Also a lot of spicy uh, cuisines like Thai, Thai food, um, lots of uh, Chinese food like Sichuan cuisine and Indian food rely on capsicum peppers for their pungency. But um, keep in mind that capsicum is a new world genus. So it wasn't known in the old world until about 1500. And so if these dishes existed before then, they must have tasted a lot different. Well, uh, peppers have a loyal following of aficionados and you may, might even say fanatics. Uh, they belong to societies like the Chili Heads, the International Society of Hot Sauce Aficionados, they have blogs, websites, newsletters, seed exchanges, uh, hot pepper uh, competitions. Um, they design all kinds of items that involve chili peppers, like clothes, lights, this clocks, home furnishings, and even this adorable baby outfit that you can dress your baby up to look like a chili pepper. So all of this excitement uh, revolves around the pungency of uh, capsicum peppers. And um, chemicals called capsaicinoids are responsible for their pungent taste. So these capsaicinoids are mainly concentrated in the placenta of the fruit. So that's the part inside the fruit where the seeds are joined on. Well, there are five domesticated species of capsicum and these are shown here. Uh, by far the most familiar and widely cultivated uh, domesticated capsicum species is capsicum annuum. So this uh, species has all kinds of name varieties, including the, the bell peppers, anchos, anaheim, serranos, jalapenos, paprika peppers, etc. So a huge variety in fruit types. So these have been selected for different uh, forms, colors, flavors, and then here's just a couple, a few examples of named varieties of mostly capsicum annuum. Well, the vast majority of research has been done on the domesticated species. And surprisingly, we've known very little about the wild species of capsicum. So many of you know uh, Gloria Barbosa. I don't know if she's here this morning with us. I hope so. If so, hi, Gloria. Um, here she is in the field collecting capsicums, and she is the world's taxonomic expert on uh, capsicum, and she's completing a monograph on the genus. So here he, she is in um, northeastern Brazil uh, in April 2009, and I was fortunate enough to go in the field with her and with Fatima Agra on this trip. Uh, we were in the Caatinga uh, vegetation formation, which is a dry thorny forest and there Gloria collected two species that subsequently were described as new species by her and Fatima. Uh, and since then she's described several more species, new species of capsicum peppers from the Andes and also from the Atlantic coastal rainforest in Brazil. So I'm going to leave it to Gloria to tell you more details about capsicum taxonomy and phylogeny. She's giving a talk on, the, on December 18th. Uh, and so today I'd just like to concentrate my talk on some issues that concern the relationship between capsicum and lysianthes. And then I'm gonna tell you a little story about our most recently described species of capsicum. Well, in contrast to capsicum, uh, the genus lysianthes is very poorly known. Uh, it consists of about 150 to 200 species, and these are dis distributed mainly in the neotropics, but there are about 30 to 40 species that are in Asia. Uh, they occur from mainland China to the Philippines, um, New Guinea, and Australia. Um, the 
the way that you can distinguish Lysianthes and Capsicum, there are several different characters. So in Lysianthes, the anthers open by terminal pores, very similar to the situation in Solanum. And you can maybe make out those pores at the tips of the anthers here in Lysianthes flowers. Whereas, as I mentioned before, in um, Capsicum, the anthers open by longitudinal slits. Lysianthes flow, uh, flowers sometimes have unequal stamens. And once again, you can see this character really well in this picture of Lysianthes prindlii. So there's one long stamen here due to a long filament and four shorter stamens. Whereas in capsicum, the st stamens are always equal or uh, are subequal. Uh, Lysianthes flowers don't have any nectar. Uh, pollen is the only reward for flower visitors. Whereas, as I mentioned before, uh, capsicum flowers produce nectar. And then uh, the fruits of Lysianthes don't contain detectable levels of capsaicinoids, so they're non-pungent. Whereas in capsicum, at least some species um, are pungent because of capsaicinoids. Well, there's a lot more variation in uh, floral morphology in Lysianthes than we see in uh, capsicum. That's maybe expected because it's a much bigger genus. So the flowers in Lysianthes can be almost rotate to deeply stellate. Uh, the corallas can be white, um, off-white, lavender, or deep purple. Uh, the fruits also have uh, various morphologies, so they can be round or elongated or pointed held upright or dangling down. And there's even this freaky looking fruit from Lysianthes acapulcensis that's blue and conical. Well, in order to investigate relationships in uh, Lysianthes and capsicum, we assembled a data set. Well, let me fix this here. We assembled a data set of uh, two nuclear genes or regions and two chloroplast genes and regions um, and this is a strict consensus tree of an analysis that includes 17 species of capsicum and 36 species of Lysianthes. Uh, the, the width of these lines here indicates the uh, bootstrap support. So the blackest lines indicate 100% uh, bootstrap support. Well, in these analyses, uh, capsicum plus Lysianthes forms a monophyletic group with 100% bootstrap support. So that's nice. And once again, I'll remind you that this entire clade then is diagnosed by the unusual calyx morphology where the teeth come out below the calyx rim. Uh, we also see in this phylogeny that capsicum is also is monophyletic itself with 100% bootstrap support. And the species of Lysianthes that we analyzed in this tree come out on two clades that I'm just calling clade A and B. And each one of these clade, clades A and B are also monophyletic with high support. However, uh, if we look closely, Lysianthes clade A is actually sister to capsicum. So in this tree, Lysianthes is, mono, is not monophyletic as currently defined. Um, but I, I need to point out that the support for this particular node is weak in this analysis. It only had about 59% bootstrap support. However, if this is the actual tree topology, this has some implications uh, for morphology and for nomenclature. So let's just um, say for the sake of argument that this is the true tree. In, in this case, we can't use our convenient uh, characters of anthropores and lack of nectar to diagnose Lysianthes, because Lysianthes is coming out as paraphyletic on this tree. And then uh, nomenclaturally, you know, to make this cladistically kosher, what are we going to do? So one thing we could do is keep capsicum as the genus capsicum. And we might want to think about transferring these species of Lysianthes clade A to capsicum because this is hanging out together as a monophyletic group. Well, I mean, that's a possibility to think about, but I'm not that wild about it. 
because uh, first of all, it would necessitate a lot of nomenclatural transfers of these Lysianthe species to capsicum, and that's kind of a pain. Um, also, we've got a more serious problem. If we want to keep this Lysianthes clade B as the genus Lysianthes, this is the issue. Uh, so the type species of Lysianthes is Lysianthes lysioides, and it occurs on clade A. So we're supposed to keep the generic name going with the type species of the genus, and so that um, kind of makes this plan a mess. And if we wanted to keep this clade B being called Lysianthes, we'd have to appeal to the nomenclature section of the International Botanical Conference to make an exception. Now, if we have this topology, you might also make an argument for recognizing three genera here, capsicum for capsicum, Lysianthes for Lysianthes clade A that has its type species, and some other genus for Lysianthes clade B. But obviously, we want to be sure about the backbone topology before we do anything like this. And we haven't been able to resolve this problem using our four gene data set. So to try and better resolve the backbone of the tree, we wanted to use genomic approaches to increase the amount of data for tree construction by orders of magnitude. And uh, fortunately, because of its economic importance, we already have some genomic resources available for uh, capsicum and its not too distantly related uh, genus Selenum. And these uh, consist of uh, either published whole genome sequences or transcriptomes. Uh, and the, the, so the blue arrow shows where we have these um, available resources, but you can see that they're concentrated in just two places in this tree. Uh, among the domesticated species of capsicum, and then among the uh, potatoes and tomatoes in the genus Selenum. So we wanted to increase uh, our coverage of these genomic resources. So we set up a collaboration with some genomics uh, researchers at UC Davis, and with their help, I was able to generate four new transcriptomes, uh, one for caps a species of capsicum, and three for species of Lysianthes. So now we have our genomic data uh, more evenly spread throughout the tree, and this allows us to identify conserved regions across taxa and design probes for next-gen sequencing. So Daniel assembled the four new transcriptomes. He compared them with the transcriptomes and uh, data that we already had that was published and he identified genes that were expressed across all taxa. Uh, and an extra um, unexpected bonus of the transcriptome data is that, by, that we were able to assemble near complete plastid sequences using the reads that didn't map to the nuclear genomes. Uh, so for example, um, the plastome sequence of capsicum chinense, which is the habanero pepper, was already published in 2016. And so we use that as a scaffold here, our reference, and we mapped, or Daniel mapped, on the reads from our transcriptome uh, study, and you can see that we got really good coverage of the plastid sequences, even though we weren't specifically targeting them in the transcriptomes. Uh, so we combined the four new uh, plastomes with the published chloroplast sequences and uh, did a phy phylogenetic analysis. Uh, so this is only the plastid data, uh, but you can see, first of all, that there are high bootstrap supports on every single node of this tree. So that's great. And what's even more interesting is that we see in this topology that capsicum turns out to be monophyletic, but Lysianthes does too. Uh, so if, if you'll recall, this plastid phylogeny differs from the topology of, of the four gene phylogeny. So in the plastome phylogeny, capsicum and Lysianthes are reciprocally monophyletic. But in the four gene phylogeny, we have Lysianthes clade A that's sister to capsicum and Lysianthes is paraphyletic. Well, uh, we wanted to in investigate this topological uh, discordance or incongruence a little bit more. 
Uh, so Daniel pulled out 130 individual nuclear genes from the transcriptome data, and he analyzed each one of these genes separately. And he found out that 79% of these 130 genes gave the four gene topology. In other words, Lysianthes is paraphyletic and, and, it's, and clade A is sister to capsicum. Whereas 21% uh, uh, of these 130 genes gave the plastome phylogeny, in which capsicum and Lysianthes are reciprocally monophyletic. So this shows us that different genes reflect different topo tree topologies and that even massive amounts of sequence data produced from next-gen approaches still may not completely resolve incongruent topologies. And we heard a version of this same story a little while ago when Edeline Gagnon uh, gave her talk. Uh, she so showed similar issues of incongruence and selenum that resulted when different uh, genes were analyzed. Well, uh, let's take a quick look at relationships in Lysianthes. So once again, uh, the species that uh, we analyzed in this data set come out on two monophyletic clades, clade A and clade B. And we still know so little about Lysianthes that I really can't give you great morphological synapomorphies that diagnose each one of these big clades. But there is one interesting result I'll point out. So we included four old world Lysianthes um, species, and they all come out together as a well-supported group in clade B, uh, indicating that there may have been a single origin of the old world Lysianthes. Now, I don't want to take this too seriously, though. We've only analyzed four of the about 30 to 40 old world Lysianthes species here. Um, so we'll have to see what happens when we add more taxa. Well, the Lysianthes phylogeny gives us lots of food for thought, and this is what we're kind of act actively working on now. But at this point, I want to take a little detour and show you a result that is pretty shocking. And in order to explain this, let's go on a field trip. So we're going to uh, southwestern Colombia in the department of Nariño. Uh, this was a field trip that we took in December 2017. Uh, here I am with my colleagues from a national university in Bogota. So here's Clara Inez Orozco in the middle with three of her students, um, Felipe, Carlos, and Gina. Um, we're at the Reserva Nat Natural Rio Nambi uh, with our guide. So here's our guide, Christian Pai. Um, he was a, he's actually a bird guide, but he was just great and knows a lot about um, pretty much everything in nature. And it being Colombia, we you can also see this armed soldier back here in the background who's keeping an eye on us. Uh, the Reserva Nambi is famous because it's the home of the long waddled umbrella bird, which is a fantastic big bird that I wanted to see so bad. Um, we didn't get to see or hear the umbrella bird, unfortunately but we were able to collect a lot of interesting Solanaceae, and one of them is this thing. So uh, this plant was not uncommon in the area. It's uh, obviously a Solanaceae, but none of us could figure out what it was. So it has this weird branching pattern that you can see here, uh, long peduncles, and then these kind of yellow green flowers uh, that had anthropores. So, while we were met, uh, pressing it and dealing with it, we called it Mysterio Dendron. Uh, but later we identified this as, this, as uh, Quatresia anomala. So Quatresia anomala was described from the Cordillera Occidental of Colombia in 2011. Uh, this is the drawing from the original description of this species. And then it's also reproduced in the Quatresia treatment for the flora of Colombia that came out in 2012. And in this uh, treatment, under Quatresia anomala, the authors say, due to the apparent porocidal dehiscence of the anthers, this species can be confused with Lysianthes and Selenum. Well, this is strange because Quatresia is supposed to have longitudinal anther dehiscence. 
So we took the leaves back to the lab, we extracted DNA, we sequenced it, uh, and we blasted the sequences. Uh, and what we found out is uh, that Quatrizia anomala is a Lysianthes. So here's a phylogenetic tree from some Lysianthes species. And I plopped in um, the se some sequences that I had from this Mysterio dendron. Um, and they turned out to fall in clade B of Lysianthes. So don't take this placement too seriously. This is uh, phylogeny from just partial sequences of, of one gene, waxy, and we need to do more sophisticated analyses. But it's obvious that Quatrizia anomala doesn't belong to Quatrizia at all. It's a Lysianthes. And so one, no wonder it was anomalous uh, within that genus. Okay, let's take a quick look at relationships in uh, capsicum. But once again, I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to defer to Gloria, and she'll be able to tell us a lot more information in her upcoming talk. So the species that we have in this particular analysis um, form three well-supported groups. Uh, we have the group one of capsicum, and this includes all the domesticated species and their relatives. And then in group, capsicum group two, these are the Andean ulupicas. So these are very hot peppers from the high Andes of Bolivia and Argentina. Um, they're often, uh, they, they usually <laughs> have round fruits that are held upright and they're bright red at maturity and they're super pungent. And then at least several of the species in this group have purple fruits. So these ulupicas are ingredients in the cuisine of the Aymara and Quechua people of the Andes. And you can frequently find them sold in markets like this one in La Paz. I don't think that ulupicas are, are cultivated um, anywhere, like on a commercial scale, but they're gathered from people's gardens and gathered from the wild and then sold in these markets. And then uh, group three of capsicum is interesting because the species here are non-pungent. And they also have an unusual chromosome number of 2n equals 26. Whereas the vast majority of uh, Solanaceae in the x equals 12 clade have a chromosome number of 2n equals 24. Uh, and this uh, group of, of non-pungent capsicums is exemplified by capsi capsicum rhomboidium that's shown here. Uh, so this species has these bell-shaped yellow flowers and then these dangling uh, red fruits that once again are non-pungent. Uh, well, uh, so what we can do with this tree is map on where pungency occurs to see if we can get an idea of where it may have originated uh, on the tree. So if we look at group one, um, these species are usually pungent, except in cultivars that have been selected by people to, to specifically be non-pungent. As I mentioned, the uh, Andean ulupicas in group two are very pungent. And then the peppers in group three are not pungent at all. So, um, and then these species in the middle here are reported to be variable in pungency. So we might hypothesize that pungency occurred somewhere around this, in this part of the tree. Uh, but once again, I don't want you to take this too seriously uh, because we're lacking a lot of capsicum species in this tree. And also we don't have very good resolution in this part of the tree. Um, so, what, but fortunately, our colleagues, Gloria Barbosa and Carolina Carrizo have a really nice capsicum tree that includes all the known species of capsicum to date. Uh, and so they, their trees have a better um, indication of where pungency may have evolved in capsicum. Well, um, let's now go on another field trip uh, to Colombia. But now we're in the southeastern part of the country in the department of Caqueta near Florencia. And this was a field trip that we took in April of 2016. Um, some of our uh, group here was on this field trip. So there's Gloria uh, Barbosa in front. 
Um, Andres was there. I see Juan David Tovar in the picture here. So he was there and, and me. So there were at least four Solanaceae specialists on this field trip. And we're out about ready to go down this really steep, muddy, slippery slope in the rain to get to the uh, field site. Um, and so that was, that was hard getting down there, but once we got down there, uh, we saw some very interesting plants that we were able to collect. And the coolest plant that we saw was this. Um, neat looking flower with long filaments, but so we had at least four Solanaceae taxonomists standing around this plant and none of us could figure out what genus it belonged to. And we, you know, hemmed and hawed and discussed it and we still couldn't figure it out. So we called it Quatrizianthes. And then back when we were pressing the plants and drinking beer, we were making some bets on what genus it might belong to. This is a fantastic plant. It's so beautiful. Um, it has this beautiful purple coloration on the leaves and stems. Look at these purple uh, pedicels, they're just amazing. And then the fruits are dark purple themselves. So the unique morphology of this plant really didn't fit in with any Solanaceae genus that we were familiar with. Um, so once again, I took the leaves back to the lab. We extracted the DNA, we sequenced it, we blasted the sequences, and um, we found out that it is a, do you wanna guess? I'll give you a couple, couple seconds to guess, and you can put your guesses into the chat. Let me see if I can go backwards. Yeah, so, so I'll just give you a couple seconds to look at the plant. Look at these neat flowers, red coloration here. Uh, check out the calyx and these amazing fruits. So don't worry if you're wrong, because we couldn't figure out what genus this belonged to either. We had to sequence it. Okay, are you ready? Capsicum, sequencing blast results show that it is a capsicum. So, but what an amazing capsicum it is. Okay, subsequently, uh, Carolina Cariso did some more sequencing and uh, constructed this tree, at, which shows that our new species belongs to the, what they are calling the Andean clade. This is the same as group three capsicums that I showed you on my tree. Uh, so this is the clade that has non-pungent fruits and chromosome numbers of 2n equals 26. Um, Gloria tasted the fruits in the field and they are non-pungent. And subsequently, Marisol Scaldeferro at U University of Cordoba verified that uh, the new species has 26 chromosomes. So we're calling it Capsicum regali. Regali means regal or royal because it's such a very regal and royal plant. And also um, because of the royal purple color of the uh, pedicels and the fruits. Um, so we, we're describing it and our paper is in press now in Phytokies. In fact, we just got the proofs this week. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, an amazing new capsicum species from the Andean Amazonian Piedmont. Okay, well, um, I'm gonna finish up then by telling you about another project that I'm involved with. And this is uh, to examine the, the genera Witheringia and Brachistus. These genera belong to the Fisali clade, so that's near and dear to some of your hearts, I know. Uh, this is a collaborative project with Judy Stone, and I saw Judy Stone's here this morning, so hey, hey there, Judy. Here she is in Panama, and I hope that she's collecting some Solanaceae on this trip. I don't know, maybe she's just trying to make a phone call. Um, and Judy and I have been interested in Witheringia for a long time, so this was a fun opportunity for us to collaborate. Well, Witheringia consists of about 25 neotropical species. Uh, it has a very checkered nomenclatural past. Um, it was described in 1788 based on a single species, Witheringia solanacea. And then Witheringia was dissolved later and then reinstated about 80 years later by Hunsinger in his uh, treatment of Witheringia that was published in 1969. 
Witheringia has included species assigned to lots of solanaceous genera, including Agnistus, Athenia, Basovia, Brachistus, Capsicum, Quatresia, Lysianthes, Sriracha, and Solanum, and maybe some other ones that I uh, forgot about here. So um, there's an intense synonymy with all kinds of taxonomic confusion. And it's been a taxonomic orphan in the Solanaceae, and we really haven't known very much about its taxonomy and phylogeny. Uh, so uh, the most complete treatment of Witheringia uh, dates from Hunsaker, 1969. He recognized 15 species in Witheringia, including three Brachista species that he considered to belong to Witheringia. Uh, later, Mario Sousa Pena examined uh, the taxonomy of this genus and produced a morphological phylogeny in his 2001 thesis, but this was never published. And we have regional treatments for parts of Mexico and Central America, including my treatment for Costa Rica that was published in 2015. And I recognized eight Witheringia species there, three Brachistas, and five Quatresia species, four of which were previously included in Witheringia lysianthes or Solanum. And Costa Rica has been thought to be the center of diversity of Witheringia, with basically one widespread species in all of South America, Witheringia solanacea, and then a couple of other more regionally restricted Witheringias in South America. Well, Witheringia has um, been thought by most people to be closely related to Brachistus or even included, included with Brachistus. So Brachistus can be distinguished from Witheringia by its calyx. So in Brachistus, the calyx has very noticeable lobes, whereas in Witheringia, the calyx lobes are uh, truncate or they have very, very small teeth. Um, there's also been a lot of confusion in the generic uh, circumscription of Witheringia and Quatresia. And for me, this, this is a difficult distinction. So in, but I, this is what I've come up with. So in Witheringia and Quatresia, the leaves are born in unequal pairs. Uh, but in Witheringia, the, the smaller leaf of the pair usually is petiolate. Whereas in Quatresia, the leaves are much more unequal. And the smaller leaf of the pear is usually sessile. Um, Hunsinger pointed out that in Quatresia, the anthers are ventrafixed. So that means that the filament joins onto the anther on the ventral side of the anther. Whereas Witheringia anthers are dorsifixed or basifixed. But this is a pretty tough character to see in tiny flowers or on lots of herbarium specimens. And then the fruits of Witheringia and Quatresia are quite different. In Witheringia, the fruits are bright red or orange. And if the calyx is a crescent, it doesn't completely cover the fruit. Whereas Quatresia fruits are white, green, yellow, or purple. And sometimes they're completely enclosed by the crescent calyx, as in this species here. So we've had a tough time distinguishing, or at least I have, distinguishing between Witheringia and Quatresia. But phylogenies are helping us straighten this out, uh, thankfully. So I'm showing you here a, a piece of the tree from Sarkinen et al. This is part of the Fisalii clade. And uh, the taxa that were, were included in this tree from Witheringia and Brachistus come out in a group here. And the, and the taxa that were used from Quatresia come out in a group that's far separated from Witheringia and Brachistus. So at least we can work from there and say that Witheringia and Quatresia are two different animals. Okay, let's go back to our Witheringia Brachistus project. And um, Judy's made a preliminary phylogeny that's shown here. So this whole central part of the phylogeny includes the species of Witheringia and Brachistus, and they together form a monophyletic group. But if we look at where Brachistus is, the okay, guy shaded Brachistus in blue, and Brachistus is not coming out to be monophyletic. Um, in, in fact, it's nested within Witheringia, and it looks like Brachistus has gotta go. 
um, it needs to be transferred or synonymized with witherinia, which is the earlier name. Uh, a couple other interesting things that are coming out here. It looks like we have a couple of new species of witherinia. So here's one of them. Uh, this is a, a, a thing that I've known about for a while when I was working on the Costa Rican flora. Uh, but I wasn't sure of whether these plants were distinctive from Witherinia solanacea. Uh, so I was pretty hesitant to describe them as a new species. But when we look at the position in our phylogeny, uh, here's this the new, the new thing from Costa Rica, it comes out here, um, not with the other accessions of Witherinia solanacea from Costa Rica uh, and Bolivia. And then, Let's just quickly go back to southeastern Colombia. So here uh, are three of us, me, Gloria, and David Hoyos, who's a botanist from uh, Florencia, Colombia. And we're about to go down that steep, muddy, slippery, nasty, yucky slope to that same field site where the capsicum is. And you can tell that we haven't gone there yet because we're still really clean. And at that same site, we collected this thing. So this is a Witheringia, um, and we called it Witheringia asterotrica because it looks a lot like Witheringia asterotrica that I'm familiar with uh, from Costa Rica. Uh, but when we put it in our phylogeny, here's Witheringia so-called asterotrica from Colombia, and it's not falling out together with Witheringia asterotrica from Central America. Uh, so it looks like this is probably a new species too. And then we uh, went back to Bogota and I went to the herbarium. And here I am at the herbarium at Call. This is a picture that Andres took of me. And I am just puzzling over these crazy Witheringias from Colombia. So I was astounded at the diversity of Witheringia specimens in the herbarium there, things that I just couldn't match with any Witheringia that I knew about previously. And Juan David Tovar has also shown me a bunch of photographs of Colombian Witheringias that no, don't match anything that I'm familiar with. So it looks like we've got a lot of work to do in the Witheringias of, of Colombia and maybe the rest of Northwestern South America are a lot more interesting and complicated than we thought. So I can hardly wait till COVID is gone and we can travel again and get these projects uh, more underway. So what are the next steps for us? Well, we want to publish our Lysianthes capsicum phylogeny. It would be great if we could add more data, more taxa, but this is kind of problematical since my lab is now shut down because of COVID. Uh, we want to describe at least two uh, new species of Witheringia, and it looks like there's more uh, in Colombia, and work a lot more on Witheringia taxonomy and phylogeny to get the big picture. Uh, Quatresia, man, it's a Pandora's box, and it, it looks like there's a lot of interesting questions to examine there, too. And I still have to deal with a lot of other projects on Solanum and other genera that I have with many of you. Um, so once again, I hope that our lives can get back to normal soon and we can uh, make a lot of progress. So before I open this up for questions and comments and discussion, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, some of the people and institutions that have helped um, with this work. Team Chili Pepper, um, you guys are great. We've, we've just done so much. Uh, Judy, thank you. And we're still working together to get those Witherinia straightened out. Our funding sources, mainly from NSF, uh, but from some support from my university and from UC Davis. I'd like to thank the members of my lab, um, past now, <laughs> um, but even in the distant past, for generating so much sequence data that's gone on into many of these studies. I'd especially like to thank my wonderful Solanaceae collaborators. You guys are the absolute best. Our, our Solanaceae community is amazing, and by our collaborative relationships, we've just accomplished so much, and we and managed to have a good time while we're doing it. And same goes for my plant collecting friends and colleagues. We've had so many adventures in the field. We've had some bad times, but mostly good times and a lot of fun and discovered and collected a lot of amazing plants. 
And then of course, the, my main inspiration, which is the Solanaceae of the world. I never imagined that I would be working my entire life on this family, but um, even if I had several lifetimes, I couldn't solve all the interesting problems that they present. So thanks to you guys for um, listening, and I'd be happy to answer questions or uh, just talk to you about Solanaceae. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. That was an amazing, amazing talk. Yes, um, please, if you want to drop questions in the chat, uh, start with an asterisk if you want me to read it. Otherwise, you can say I have a question and I will ask you to, to uh, do the question. I'm sorry about my technological glitches at the beginning. Um, okay, so First, I have to see if anybody guessed the genus right. Mario, Lucianthus. Leandro, capsicum, exclamation point. Lysianthes, Lysianthes, capsicum. Yay, <laughs> okay, good job, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so Franco, he says, um, well, uh, it would be great to make some chromosome studies on Lysianthes, quadrates and Lysianthes, so, so please um, keep some seeds for him. <laughs> He'll oh. that. I, I do have a question about uh, the phylogeny that it's, it's super nice about the phylogeny of the Witheringia, um, yes, and Brachistus, and Quatresia, of course, for the physicality. And have you included uh, some Celtalia species on that phylogeny of Witheringia and Brachistus? Because then um, in the phylogeny that we did on physicality, we, we saw some closer related um, relationships between Celtalia and uh, with the ancient and Brachistus. Oh, that's a good suggestion, we'll see. We should do that. Uh, so maybe we can just um, use data that's already been generated and put them in our tree, um, if that's okay. Yes, I think, yes. Our sequence is now in Shinbank, and we included the, yeah, some, quad, uh, some Celtalia, and there are some sequences that are also, um, they were already available in Shinbank. Okay, that's great. We'll, we'll get in touch. Judy and I will get in touch with you guys and yeah, sure. give us some suggestions for other Fasali to, to maybe examine in those trees. That's great. So we have, wait, we have some questions. Um, okay, so Alison Caldwell is... Hi, my, my question. If you want to turn on your microphone. I can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, it happens so often these days that clades have to be split off, but because of paraphyly, and it's painful to lose the name. I was wondering, is, are people talking about some kind of Latin or Greek suffix that indicates it came from that other group, like just off the top of my head, Lysianthorum, the plural Lysianthes, or Lysianthensis from the land of Lysianthes. You know, these are probably the best choices, but it seems like there should be some standard things so people understand, oh, this used to be part of Lysianthes. Not that I know of. Some, something to think about a precedent for setting thing for. It'll happen to you. Maybe the Philo Code people will. Uh, do something like that. Thank you for the question. Then there is a question of Mario Vallejo Marin. If you want to turn on your microphone. Thank you very much, Rocio. Lynn, that was a wonderful talk. I really, really enjoyed it. I uh, learned a lot. And I was wondering if you uh, could tell us a little bit more about the evolutionary history of porocidal anthers in Lysianthus. Is this just uh, identical to Solanum, or there, is there anything between Solanum and Lysianthus without porocidal anthers? Well, um, a while ago, you know, many Lysianthes were included in Solanum, and it was kind of thought that maybe those porocidal anthers in the two groups, you, you know, they, they had a single origin. But our phylogenies have shown instead that Solanum, the whole clade, is sister to Haltamata that has longitudinal anther dehiscence. So it's pretty set that there have been two origins of porocidal anther dehiscence in Lysianthes, one in Lysianthes, one in Solanum. But boy, it would be so interesting if, you know, it's not gonna be me because I'm a taxonomist, but 
to examine genes that are responsible for the development of those pores. Sometimes a little, a little ambiguous um, because some Solanaceae anthers actually start out kind of sort of like pores and then they open longitudinally eventually. So functionally they might be functioning as pores and I saw this in Witheringia when I was working in Costa Rica on them. Some were actually buzz pollinated when they were young. So there's a whole bunch of interesting evolutionary and developmental questions that involve those two types of dehiscence. But as far as its evolution, it looks like there's separate origins in Lysianthes and Selenum. That sounds wonderful. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll be in touch with more questions about that since I'm, I'm studying bus pollination in these groups. Okay, fantastic. Great. Thanks. That's great. Thank you for your question, Mario. Um, Yes, um, Xavier Aubert, he has a question. Well, he says that from what he has seen in Lysiantes in the old world, it's a nightmare to tell species apart because all things look alike, like, like Lysiantes biflora. Um, what are the features to look at? What is the progress? How do we tell old world Lysiantes species apart? It's on Lysiantes taxonomy. Probably is that more a question also for him? Yes. But yeah. Yes, it, I just want to, from what I've seen on herbarium specimens, everything looked really similar to me when I was looking at things that were attributed to different species of Lycanthes in the old world. So I was wondering uh, how you really differentiate uh, Lycanthes species. So what are the best morphological features to look at to, uh, to tell Lycanthes species apart one from each other? And is there a lot of progress on Nikandes taxonomy at the moment? Or? Well, there's going to be, because you know who's in charge of old world Lysianthes taxonomy is Sandy Knapp. Okay. So, so Sandy has gotten out all the species. There's a whole bunch of them from New Guinea that are, okay. and they're hard. I agree. They're really hard for me, but she's been working on them like during COVID, <laughs> like, like crazy. So I have, a lot of faith that she's going to be able to straighten them out. I've been working on the New World Lysianthes mainly, um, so yeah. I can't really answer your question very well. Okay, but in the New World, they are easy to uh, to identify and differentiate. Well, they're not all that easy. Okay. <laughs> there's some that are pretty hard, but there's a lot more diversity, it's true. And maybe this also, uh, I kind of think that the Old World Lysianthes do have a single evolutionary origin, and and for that reason, they're morphologically really similar. But it would be okay. good if we could confirm that. Okay, yeah, because it really looked a bit like Solanum sometimes with one or two species with a very huge distribution area, and some very restricted species, like restricted in in some places. So so that was difficult to know what is a species in uh, in Nicantes, What what I found to be difficult. So, okay, I, good. I agree. Like Lysianthes biflora is, is very widespread, but then there's some really rare ones from Asia. And that's yep. makes things hard too when you just don't have many specimens to look at. Okay, good. Day. Thanks. Thank you, Xavier. And sorry that my internet is coming and going. So Federico has a question now. Federico Roda. Yes, hi. Nice talk. No. I have a question, and, and there is probably no, no answer, but since I'm not a taxonomist, I'll, I'll ask it. So, uh, you have this uh, discrepancy between nuclear and uh, plastid uh, phylogenies, which might have a biological cause, like it's not a methodological problem. Is there a consensus in the taxonomic uh, community about what to do when that happens? Do you believe the nuclear genes? Do you believe the plastid? Because this, in this case, it has an implication for the name of, of, of the species and so. That's right. So, I, you know, when I first started working, we really didn't, we didn't have molecular phylogenies. So the, the hope was always that we were gonna get the answer. And, and, you know, I've lived through all sorts of different molecular data and different types of analyses and reached the point where now we're in the next generation sequencing phase. 
with massive amounts of data, transcriptome data, whole genome sequences. And I think the hope is still that the more data that we throw with these problems, the better our phylogenies will get until we get the answer. But now it's becoming increasingly clear that even with massive amounts of data, they're giving us these incongruencies that actually has a biological source. And in, in the case, we, we, we uh, analyzed that node with using some uh, analytical programs to see what could be causing that discordance. And it's pretty obvious it's incomplete lineage sorting. And that's exactly what uh, Edeline's talk was about, or part of her talk. So this is going to be all over the place. And I think, so I'm a taxonomist. And so a lot of my job is identifying plants, you know, in the field and the herbarium. And so, for instance, in our uh, discordant uh, phylogenies with capsicum and lysianthes, I don't want to change it. I don't want to sink lysianthes into capsicum because now we can tell them apart really well. Um, and we've got that node that's interesting, but you know, it's not like I want to ignore the phylogeny, but we know the sources of that incongruence and it looks like it's not going to go away. Um, so I think everybody just has to not think in black and white, but look at the gray and, and look at the genes that are responsible for the discordance. So it'd be really interesting to parcel out, for instance, the 21% of the nuclear genes that gave the plastid phylogeny and see what the function of those genes is, if, if we know that, and if it has something to do with you know, why we get that tree. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, in answer to your question, I, I think we're gonna do the best we can, but as a, as a taxonomist, in the end, I wanna make a taxonomic scheme that is practical, that people can actually use, um, that's maybe not faithfully following everything we see in the phylogenies, but it helps us to actually get some stuff done. Okay, thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And there is also a question of Carolina Carrizo. Is she here? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I forgot the microphone was off. Hi, Lynn. It's really Hi, nice to you, and thank you for the talk. My question has um, is related partially with what you mentioned about this group of genes that give you different topologies. Um, do you, have you checked which genes are in each group just to see, for instance, if there is any particular maybe related to pungency? Because the, the, the metabolism of, uh, of capsaicin is really long. There are a lot of genes involved. Maybe there is something there that is um, making difference or is different or, I don't know, something like that. With, what you said, <laughs> what particular genes are in that group? Right. That would be a great follow-up to do. Um, I'm not the person to do that, but Daniel did some really nice analyses of those genes. And I think in our transcriptome paper, he does talk about the gene ontology terms for the, the yeah. genes in those two different groups. But I don't think any of them that I remember had, had a great story to tell, like pungency yeah. or something. But delving into that would be really, really great. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that we, that hasn't been my focus. My focus is trying to figure out Lysianthes and capsicum taxonomy. Yeah. But great yeah. idea, Carolina. That would be wonderful if someone wants to follow up on that. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. And there is also a question of uh, Claudio Galmarini. I don't know if he's here. If I can read it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Actually, it's me. Oh. <laughs> I'm Heidi with, with my husband name. Uh, but, uh, he's also a capsicum researcher. Uh, he works mainly in breeding, capsicum breeding. But uh, sorry, I didn't change the name. Uh, it's uh, very nice to see you again, uh, Lynn. Thank you for your nice talk and colorful talk. 
And I just want to ask you if you know about pungency variability in natural populations in capsicum. Because uh, one of our students is working for now for a PhD in Solanum uh, capsicum chacoense populations in Catamarca. And he found in the same population following the same plants that pungency can change uh, between years and between localities. So the same plant can have a very pungency fruits one year and mild or not pungent fruits the following year. Oh. So uh, he's trying to uh, domesticate, I mean, to introduce into cultivation a uh, capsicum chacoense because people normally use as a condiment. So I wonder if you know about another capsicum that can change or have a variability in pungency. Yes, so it and is. And the other question oh, <laughs> is about, yeah, the other question is about, uh, I saw in your illustrations that uh, some of the seeds have uh, hairs. Did you take a look of uh, seed patterns? to differentiate between genera? Yeah, between genera. I haven't, and that would be great. I mean, I think seed, mor seed surface morphology is an understudied character throughout the Solanaceae. And in Solanum, it can probably, it can help us too, but it's just kind of uh, tedious to use the SEM to look at the morphology. In our new capsicum, it, the seed projections are really interesting. Um, so they are distinctive. But I want to go back to your first question on variability and pungency. So I, if I recall, Josh, Josh Chooksbury has a series of papers, of, uh, maybe from about 15 years ago or so now, on capsicum chacoense and its variation in pungency. And he did some ecological studies on um, fruit dispersal, fruit dispersers in the field. Mm. And then it is- Anant. Hmm? A, a fruit, a, by ants. I mean, the, well, the ants. And then also- yeah. <laughs> But anyway, in the sort of central part of the capsicum phylogeny are a bunch of species that could be variable in pungency. So I remember one of them is capsicum coccinium from Bolivia. Um, there's various reports of whether uh, the fruit's not being pungent or pungent. And mostly it's from herbarium specimen data. You know, most herbarium specimens don't have any data because people don't necessarily taste the fruits. But Gloria and Carolina will know a lot more about this. Their big capsicum phylogeny even has a, a, a character scoring a column for whether the species are variable in pungency. So I go look at that paper, first of all, to see which species there are. And maybe Carolina and Gloria, if you're on the call, you might have something to say about that. Yes, we know that uh, in Capsicum Eximium, in Capsicum Bacatum and also in Capsicum um, Lexosum, we can find uh, some fruits uh, not pan, not spicy. And, um, but uh, we don't have a, a complete study about it happens in the, in the same populations. No, some specimens have fruits uh, Pungency fruits and others not, not pungent fruits. I think that we need a deep um, study in this aspect, in the wild species of capsicum. Sorry to jump in. There are also um, some uh, um, studies related to the variations um, according to the uh, environmental conditions. So maybe there is, that is a reason for what one year they are pungent and the next year they are not. I think I will have to check. I don't remember the, the authors, oh, but there are some records. 
Oh, sorry, that's super cool actually. So do you think that it could be related to precipitation? So which environment variables? I think it's related to yeah, humidity or environmental humidity or precipitations. I will have to check. I don't remember. I think that it's related to dryness or something. I don't even remember the names of the authors. I will have to check. <laughs> but yeah, there is some information. I have a big folder with a lot of um, articles about pungency. I will have to check. Oh, Leon Moylesh has said that uh, David Hack is the lead author of that, uh, those articles, or that article in particular. Probably, yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember. I'm, I'm confused with just very, um, some people from Brazil also is doing something. I will have to check it. David Haik was a PhD student of Josh Tewksbury's. And that was work from Josh's lab. And as I understand it, it was that plants that lived in more mesic habitats uh, had greater pungency or, and those in drier habitats didn't. I don't think it was variability from season to season with the immediate environment, but rather that across the range of the species, there was adaptation based on resistance to fungal infection which I think was more likely in more moist or music habitats. Yeah, we also, sorry, um, and there is some other people working here in Cordoba with Chocoense, and they also found uh, one year that one population was uh, hot and the next year it was not hot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's something too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really interesting. Interesting. That's super interesting. And now that Dick, you are already here, so if you want to do the question that you were, yeah, you are in the Well, I, first of all, I should apologize to Lynn and all of you for not having noted in the uh, announcement that the time zone change and so. Hey, hey, Dick, I almost gave the talk at the wrong time because I was confused too. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm gonna apologize too, because I did the same thing. I think we're getting old, guys. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, I, I've been enjoying getting up in time to go to these 8 a.m. talks on Friday, but now it's going to be 7 a.m. <laughs> so in Seattle. Um, but I came in right as you were answering a question about resolving a difficult node in Lysianthes and Capsicum. I presume it's the node in Lysianthes and Capsicum that determines whether Capsicum is nested within Lysianthes. Is that the, the node, Lynn, that you were? It's, it's a pesky about? node that makes... Yeah part of Lysianthes want to be monophyletic with capsicum. Right. So well, we, I mean, that was the first result we got with our chloroplast data showed that. And, uh, and your note was that with huge amounts of data from next gen sequencing, this is still difficult because of uh, incomplete lineage sorting. Yeah. But you would expect more incomplete lineage sorting with nuclear genes than with chloroplast genes because the plastome is a haploid uh, genome, and therefore it has a much faster coalescence time than nuclear genes do. So in the circumstances in which incomplete lineage sorting is most likely to occur when there's been you know, re relatively short time between speciation events, um, the plastome would be expected to resolve those nodes better. So maybe we should give more weight to the plastid gene gene tree for that. I love that answer because that's the phylogeny that I love where capsicum and lysianthes are reciprocally monophyletic and that's what the plastum phylogeny tells us. So now you've hit one of my really big pet peeves, the use of the term reciprocal monophyly. Okay. Those two groups and as you just described it are monophyletic, right? Yes. Reciprocal, yes. the term reciprocal monophyly has its roots in a day when a lot of molecular phylogenetic studies were unrooted. And you could find two parts of a tree, an unrooted tree, that if the root fell between them, both would be monophyletic. And so those two groups were called reciprocally monophyletic because we didn't know. Is that right? I, I so it, it, that term should never be used when you have a resolved tree. <laughs> 
Okay, I beg your pardon. <laughs> they are both monophyletic groups. That's right, okay. Phylogeny, <laughs> which is great, which is great because they're quite distinctive. Mm -hmm. Capsicum and Lysianthes morphologically. And, you know, name changing in a clade like that with an incredibly important economic crop plants is always problematic. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm happy to not mess around with Lysianthes and be transferring them to capsicum. Good. Okay, that's super great. Thank you for the questions. And yes, I don't know if there is a one last question for Lynn that you want to ask. Otherwise, like we are finishing the seminar. Um, well, thank you everyone. I'm sorry for the my internet glitches. Um, so next week we are going to have Corey Hamilton, that she is a PhD student and she's going to present her work about Silem sap from Y resistant tomato, how inhibits growth of the pathogen Rastonia solanaciarum. So thank you everyone and see you next Friday. Remember that yeah, it's uh, uh, an hour earlier now in the US. I'm sorry for the ones that yeah, confused a bit of time. Um, thank you for being here anyways.